This lecture is an, an introductory course on rings and modules at about the level of a first year graduate course. So um, before giving or recalling the definition of a ring, let's just look at the obvious examples and then write down what they have in common. So first of all, we have the integers, the real numbers and the complex numbers. And what these all have in common is they have addition and subtraction and multiplication. And a very informal definition of a ring is it's something with these three operations. And there are plenty of other examples. Um, so for example, we have polynomial rings. So these are just polynomials of the form a0 plus a1x and so on. Or you can have matrix rings. Um, so m n of r means n by n matrices. For example, we might have two by two matrices, a, b, c, d under matrix multiplication. Um, if you've done a number theory course, we have things like the Gaussian integers, which are all numbers of the form a plus b i with a and b integers. Um, or if you've done algebraic geometry, you might get things like coordinate rings, these are just polynomials on a curve and a typical coordinate ring might look like you take complex um, polynomials in two variables and you quotient out by an ideal that we'll be discussing later um, and get the ring of all poly. This would be the ring of all polynomials on an elliptic curve. Um, so a um, slightly more exotic example might be the quaternions which are all numbers of the form a plus b i plus c j plus d k and these are non-commutative so i j is equal to k which is equal to minus j i and of course matrices are generally non-commutative so if you look at these two matrices um, they don't commute with each other so let's try and abstract the common um, properties of all these rings in order to get the axioms. Um, you should remember um, it's all too common to write down a set of axioms and then um, investigate their consequences. That's the wrong way round. What you do is you first write down examples and then you write down axioms based on these examples as a way to save having to prove the same things over and over again. So first of all we have the operations plus, minus and dimes. And the first axiom is it's an abelian group under addition and subtraction. And of course, there's a zero element. Um, secondly, there's a multiplication that's associative. So ABC is equal to ABC. Um, and thirdly, we have the distributive axioms. a times b plus c is a b plus a c and since our ring is not commutative we'd better put in the other one so a plus b times c is a c plus b c um, and now there are a couple of extra optional axioms you can put in so first of all we could say it's commutative a b equals b a for all a b and um some people assume this. So, so in algebraic geometry and number theory, almost all the rings you get are commutative and it's really tiring to keep saying this word commutative. So you tend to just assume uh, that rings are commutative. Otherwise you call them commutative rings. Um, the second optional axiom is the existence of an identity one with one A equals A one equals A. Um, and here there's no real consensus on whether you should include this. So, so um, you can have the arguments for or against it. Well, an argument against it is there are plenty of things that don't satisfy this. For instance, the even integers satisfy all the axioms of a ring, but they don't quite have an identity. Um, another example in analysis is just the um, functions of compact support on a topological space X. So this might be just continuous functions, say real valued functions on X with compact support. 
and you can make this into a ring under pointwise multiplication, but this ring doesn't necessarily have an identity because the identity would have to be the function that was one everywhere, and this might not have compact support if x isn't compact. And analysts like functions of compact support because, you know, they like to integrate functions and you can integrate them if they've got compact support, but not in general. So, so these sorts of rings do turn up in analysis and they quite often don't naturally have an identity. Um, the arguments in four, uh, in favour of this, is it, is it makes things easier. For instance, um, if you want to prove existence of maximal ideals, Um, as a typical example, it's easier if your ring has an identity element. The other argument in favour of it is that if you've got a ring without an identity, then you can just take a direct sum with the integers and, the, and you just sort of make the identity of the integers into an identity for this ring here. So 1 times anything in R is going to be R and you can easily check that this is a ring. So if a ring doesn't have an identity, it's a fairly trivial operation just to add an identity, so you're not losing all that much by adding an identity. I should say that this operation does actually lose a bit of information. In analysis you can get rings without identity that become isomorphic if you, if you add an identity to them, but whatever. Um, consensus seems to be in algebra people usually assume the existence of an identity in analysis, people quite often don't, so whether you do this depends on whether you are doing algebra or analysis. Um, now what I'm going to do is uh, show there's a very close analogy between groups and rings. So a, a lot of basic constructions you can do for groups, you can also do for rings. So I'm going to go through this as a way of kind of introducing a lot of basic um, operations in on, on rings. First of all, what can a group do? Well, a group acts on a set. So if you've got a group G acting on S, it means we've got um, for any element G of the group, we can apply it to an element S. And of course, you have GH of S equals GH of S and so on. Um, rings act on modules. So what's a module? Well, a module is really just a fancy way of saying a vector space. So if your ring is a field, the modules are just vector spaces. And for various historic reasons, we, we, we use different words, vector space or module, depending on whether the ring is a field or not, which is as usual, this is illogical, but mathematics terminology just is. So a module is defined in exactly the same way as a vector space. So if you've got a ring R and a module M, we have a multiplication. Um, we can multiply an element of M by an element of R, and this is distributive. It's left and right distributive, and it satisfies this associative condition RSM equals RSM. And if your ring has an identity, you want to say 1 times m is equal to m. So examples of the modules, first of all, vector spaces. Um, another example is if r is the integers, the modules are just abelian groups. So modules are a common generalization of vector spaces and abelian groups, and most common operations you can do to vector spaces and abelian groups can be generalized to, to modules. Um, well, uh, there's actually one slight problem um, that I ought to point out. First of all, for groups acting on a set S, we have left or right or two-sided actions. So left action, we can multiply um, we, we can multiply an element of S by G on the left. For a right action, we can multiply it on the right. And for a two-sided action, we can multiply it on the left or the right. And we want these left and right actions to commute. So it, we end up looking a bit like the associative law. And for modules, we can do the same. We get left, right, 
or two sided modules. And again, just as before, we can multiply um, for left modules, we multiply on the on on the left for right modules we multiply on the right and for two-sided modules we can multiply on the left or on the right and of course this should um, be the same. Now if a ring is commutative then there's no real difference between left and right modules because you can just flip the multiplication over to the other side and you get the same thing. For non-commutative rings these are slightly different um, so you have to be a bit careful about that. Um, now with groups acting on sets we can take if you've got a group acting on S and a group acting on T we can take the disjoint union of S and T and the group obviously acts on that. For modules we can do exactly the same. If we've got a module M and a module N over a ring then we can take the direct sum of all pairs M N and this forms a module over R in the obvious way. You just say R times M N is equal to R M R N. And you can easily check this is a module. Um, for sets, we can also take a product of two sets and this is acted on by, um, on by a group. There's an analog for this for rings, which is a little bit more subtle. It's called the tensor product. Um, the tensor product of arbitrary modules takes a little bit of effort to define. Um, there's one case when it's easy to define, which is for vector spaces. So suppose we've got two vector spaces V and W, and suppose they've got bases V, I and W, J. Then we take a new vector space whose basis consists of these expressions V, I tensor W, J. And um, so you notice the size of S times T is equal to the size of S times the size of T. And the size of a module corresponds to the dimension of a vector space. And you see the dimension of V tensor W is equal to the dimension of V times the dimension of W. So, so at least for vector spaces, you see there's an analog of taking a product of two sets actually on by a group. And as we say that, the, that we will see a more general version of this later. Um, there's one thing you've got to be a little bit more careful about. Um, so if you take the disjoint union of two modules, of, of two sets, suppose you've got two sets S and T, then we, we notice that the number of elements in S union of T is equal to the size of S um, plus the size of T minus the size of S intersection T. And this has an analog for vector spaces. You can easily check the dimension of U plus V is the dimension, sorry, the dimension of U plus V here. U and V are both contained in some space W. So this isn't the direct sum. So it's going to be the dimension of U plus the dimension of V minus the dimension of U intersection V. And for three um, sets, there's a very similar formula. So the size of S union T union U is equal to the size of S plus the size of T plus the size of U. And then you have to subtract the size of the intersections, uh, which is the other one. That's, that should be a U minus T intersection U. And then you see you've over subtracted so you should add the dimension of s intersection t intersection u. Now you can try doing this for vector spaces so the dimension you can compare the dimension of u plus v plus w to the dimension of u plus the dimension of v plus the dimension of w minus the dimension of u intersection v minus the other two plus the dimension of u intersection v intersection w. And the trouble is you find these are not actually equal in general. And this is a sort of standard um, trap for people to fall into. An easy example of this is you take um, U, V and W to be dimension one in a two dimensional space. And then you can check the two sides of this are actually not equal. So I have to be a little bit careful about the analogy between groups and modules over a ring because the analogy occasionally breaks down a bit. Um, 
Next, we have Cayley's theorem, which says that every group is the symmetries of something. Um, so for every abstract group you can find some mathematical object such as it's the group of symmetries of. And we recall how to do this. If the group is G, then this something is going to be the set G acted on the right by G. So you can think of G as an abstract set and it's got an action of right multiplication by G. And the symmetries is given by G acting on the left. This is very confusing because there are three copies of G. There's, there's G considered as a set, there's G acting on this on the right, and there's G acting on this on the left. And, and the left action is the set of symmetries of G with a right action. That's sort of because the left and the right actions commute. Um, and there's an analogue for rings. Every ring is the set of endomorphisms of some linear object. So let's explain what this means. Well, endomorph, so a linear object is going to be some, something R, it should be at least be an abelian group plus some extra structure. We're not quite sure what the structure is going to be, but linear sort of means it should be at least an abelian group. And an endomorphism just means a map from M to itself, preserving this linear structure, whatever that means. Um, and um, the um, what we want to do is to find some abelian group with some sort of structure whose endomorphisms are the ring we first thought of. So, so I suppose our ring is R. Well, we just take M to be the ring R itself with a right action of R. So we can think of R as being a right um, module over, over itself. And then the um, endomorphisms, you can easily check, is just the same as R acting on the left. So it's just as confusing as for groups. For groups we have three copies of G and here we've got three copies of R. First of all we're considering R as a module. Secondly we're thinking of R as acting on this as the right to give it its linear structure. And finally the set of endomorphisms of this you can easily check is just exactly the elements of R acting on the left. So rings are exactly the endomorphisms of linear objects in the same way that groups are exactly the symmetries of objects. Um, anyway, we should say a little bit more about endomorphisms or homomorphisms of rings. So we have homomorphisms of groups. So you can have a map G to H preserving the group structure, and we can define homomorphisms of rings in the same way. We have a map from a ring R to a ring S, and it should preserve all the um, group operations, sorry, the ring operations. The one thing you've got to be a little bit careful about is um, some things you might think are homomorphisms of rings and not actually homomorphisms of rings. For example, you know by the Chinese remainder theorem, z over 6z is isomorphic to z over 2z times z over 3z as groups. And this holds for rings as well. And you might think, well, z over 2z is going to be a subring of z over 6z. Well, it isn't. So this is not a subring of z over 6z. And it sort of certainly looks like a subring. I mean, it. It, 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 the, the, the map from this to z over 6z preserves addition and multiplication and subtraction. So why isn't it a homomorphism? Well, it does not take the identity to the identity. So if you look at z over 6z, it has um, six elements. And the subring, well, sorry, the subset if, if you try mapping z over 2z to it using the Chinese remainder theorem, you find it consists of these two elements here. So this is 
z over 2z. And this is an identity for z over 2z, but it's not mapped to the identity for z over 6z. So, so you've got to be a little bit careful about homomorphisms and subrings. Uh, some things you think are homomorphisms are not quite. Um, well, as well as homomorphisms of groups, we have um, maps of G sets. So if S and T are acted on by G, then we can look at the maps from S to T that preserve the, the um, action of G. And we can do the same for modules. We can get homomorphisms of modules. So if, we, if M and N are modules over a ring, then we can have a homomorphism of them. These are also called linear transformations, especially if you're doing linear algebra. So homomorphisms of modules are more or less just the same as linear transformations in linear algebra, which um, over a field, you, you can describe them by matrices. Um, there's one thing you've got to be a little bit careful of. Um, you need to distinguish between left modules and right modules. So if M and N are left modules, um, then homomorphisms F from M to N should be on the right. So you should really write MF um, as an element of N. And the reason for this is you want RMF to be equal to RMF. So um, you, you, you want to keep things in the same order. Um, if you try writing the linear transformations on the left, then you will get RFM equals FRM. And this is going to cause real problems if your ring is non-commutative because you're swapping the order of R and F and when you start having two linear transformations and start messing up their order, things are going to get really hairy. Um, for vector spaces, you don't get this problem because in vector spaces, rings are commutative. So, so it doesn't really matter whether you multiply on the left or the right. Um, however, if you're working with arbitrary rings, um, well, well, some authors do write linear transformations of left modules on the left, but things get rather messy. It's much better to write linear transformations for left modules on the right. And of course, linear transformations of right modules should be written on the left. Um, um, next, we have um, subgroups. And of course, these correspond to subrings. And there are lots of easy examples of this. For instance, Z is a subring of the reals, and the reals is a subring of the polynomial ring, and so on. So there's not very much to say about subrings, except for this comment I had earlier that some things you think are subrings might not actually be subrings because they, they don't preserve the identity. Um, well, as well as subgroups, we also have this concept of normal subgroups. So if you've got a map from um, a, a, a ring, sorry, a group G to a group H, the kernel is going to be an, uh, something called a normal subgroup. And you remember from group theory that a normal subgroup just turns out to be a group such that G n G to the minus one is in n whenever G is in the group and n is in the normal subgroup. So what's the analog for rings? Well, the analog for rings is ideals. And this gets a little bit confusing because there are three sorts of ideals. We can have left, right, or two-sided ideals. So let's say what the difference is. Well, um, first of all, two-sided ideals, these are just going to be the kernels of homomorphisms of rings. So if we've got a map from ri a ring R to a ring S, then the kernel of this is going to be um, an ideal. And we can check that the properties of I, that it has to be satisfies that I is closed under 
addition and subtraction and contains zero, rather obviously because it's the kernel of a group homomorphism, so it must be a subgroup of R under addition. Um, it's closed under multiplication, but it actually has a stronger property. It must be closed under multiplication by elements of R. So if I is in the ideal and R is in R, then IR and RI must both be in I. So um, this is stronger than saying I must be closed under multiplication. For example, if you take the ring of polynomials in X squared, this is a subring of the ring of polynomials in X, but this is not an ideal because although it's closed under multiplication, it's not closed under multiplication by X. So this is called a, an example of a two-sided ideal because it's closed under multiplication on the left and on the right by elements of R. Um, conversely, it's easy to check that if you've got um, something satisfying these conditions, then you can take the quotient of R by it and you get a ring. Um, next, we have left and right ideals. Here you look at left and right modules or rather we look at left and right submodules. So if we've got a left module, then n, then we can look at left submodules m, and it's pretty obvious what they are. Now, if you take n to be the ring r considered as a left module, then m is what's called a left ideal. So it's just a, a left ideal, it's just a submodule of r, uh, considered as a left module. And, and you see that's just the same as saying it's closed under multiplication on the left by elements of R. Um, so we can give an example of this. Suppose you take M, so, so suppose you take R to be say two by two matrices over the integers. So they're just going to be matrices A, B, C, D with A, B, C, D integers. And then you take all the matrices of this form and this is a right ideal well it, 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 uh, there's a good chance it's a right ideal I might just have got muddled up and maybe it's the left ideal but who cares and this is the left ideal or possibly a right ideal and if you want a, an example of a two-sided ideal you can just take all things with even entries so this is equal to a two-sided ideal and you can take the quotients of these ideals by R um, and the quotient by the left and the right ideals will be Z squared. Uh, the difference being that in one of these it's Z squared with R acting on the left and in the other it's Z squared with R acting on the right and I, I really can't figure out which is which. Um, this one you get a ring and the ring is just two by two matrices with coefficients in Z modulo 2Z. Um, so a final example of the analogue between um, groups and rings I'm going to mention is you might look at the symmetric group SN, which is all symmetries of n points. Um, the analogue of this for rings is the symmetry group of a sum of n copies of R. So sums of copies of R are called free modules and they're the simplest sort of modules. For instance, if you're doing vector spaces, you know every vector space is a sum of direct sum of copies of the field K because every vector space has a basis. So if your ring R is a field, then all modules are free modules. And that's one of the reasons why fields are so easy to work with. In, in general, modules over more general rings get much more complicated. Anyway, the, the analogue of N points would be a free module on N generators. And SN is a set of symmetries of endpoints, so the analogue should be the set of linear transformations of R to the N. And just as in linear algebra, this is just the N by N matrices over, over the ring. Um, you can um, 
it's easy to that, 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 that there's an easy and a hard way to see it this is a ring the hard way is to write down the definition of matrix multiplication explicitly and check this is associative by brute force which is a not exactly difficult but it's a little bit painful the easy way is to notice that if you've got the linear transformations of any module whatsoever that is automatically a ring for rather trivial reasons and then it's easy to see that the set of linear transformations of r to the n can be identified with n by n matrices and the usual definition of matrix multiplication is just the definition of composition of linear transformations okay next lecture i'll be doing um, some more examples of rings such as group rings and Burnside rings.